Okay, so I, I'm going to assume that, that the stream's only just starting now, and I'm going to go right back to the start. So if, if it was streaming before and you've been watching the slides, please, uh, please let me know. That would be good. Um, oh, there's an ad now. Skip the if you're in, skip the ad. I just wanted to try ads. I wondered what happened. Okay, so I'm going to go right back to the start because uh, I don't think it was working before, um, and I'll, I'll probably go through it a bit quicker than what I was doing before, which is a good thing because whenever you do something for the second time, it always goes much better, right? And that's why I'd say with like part two topics if you've got plenty of time practice some of the topics and if you get that topic and take your test it's going to be so much easier okay so it's streaming now okay so I, I, I know what I did wrong and uh, anyway so let, let me start over again so my name's Mike Watty I've been an IELTS examiner in Adelaide and Taipei and um, uh, now I run a, uh, a website called IELTS answers.com and I help people prepare for their IELTS test by giving mock speaking tests and also correcting people's writing. Um, I'll put a link in the description if you want to find out about those services uh, but the purpose today is just to have a live stream and um, give you guys the opportunity to ask questions to me an ex-examiner about the test and just find out um, certain things that you know any questions that are puzzling you uh, so then what I'm going to do today I want to go through the three parts of the test make sure you understand what happens um, then move on to the grading criteria and some of the key things that the examiner is looking for and some of the mistakes students often make. Um, you can ask questions at any time periodically I'm going to stop in the live stream and look at the comments and answer people's questions right because th this is the main thing with a live stream is your chance to ask me questions if I just want to teach you things uh, I, I can just make a video that's not live and sometimes that's more effective and I, I don't have technical problems um, and if, if this time I'll, I'll get on to a couple of examples from students that I've had and let you listen and so you can see what is a band 7 what's a band 6 and just highlight a couple of things that are holding these students back right so often times people are quite talented their level of English is quite high but there's things that hold them back in the speaking test right uh, so we'll have a look at some of those. Um, so onto the format, it's designed to be 11 to 14 minutes in total. It, it shouldn't be under 11 minutes. The only reason it might be under 11 minutes is if the candidate's giving short answers throughout the test. And in that case, if it's under 11 minutes, they're probably going to be getting a low score. They're not going to be getting a high score for fluency because they're, they're not showing the examiner um, an ability to talk at length. Um, and then it won't be any longer than 14 minutes and that's kind of a fairness issue that uh, candidates shouldn't be given more than 14 minutes because it'll give them an unfair advantage possibly. So maximum four, 14 minutes. And, and then we've also got times for each of the three parts. So part one is four to five minutes. It's designed, it's got 11 questions. There's always a starting topic, usually your work, study, home you're living in, place you're living in. There's three questions for the starting topic and then there'll be two more topics, maximum of four questions for each of those. The other thing about part one, it's questions about you, uh, about 25% or more of the questions are about what you like or what you don't like. So be prepared for those questions. Have some language for rephrasing like keen on, fond of, big fan of, dislike, can't stand, not my cup of tea. Um, 
the, the other thing you could do if you're preparing is um, go to a website like mine that has some of the current questions on it and just look down through the topics and think of any vocabulary you know about that topic Be, because it's harder when you're under pressure during the test right you're getting asked questions like do you like chocolate and you don't really have time to think much of vocabulary because you're just trying to answer the question but if you looked at the topic of chocolate before the test you could um, you could prepare words like dark chocolate milk chocolate um, uh, bitter tastes bitter right dark chocolate tastes bitter and that would spice up your answers a bit now part two is um, you're, you're asked to speak for one to two minutes um, one minute's a bit short the examiner is going to have a negative view on that if it's only one minute if it's a minute and a half most examiners wouldn't be having any sort of negative thoughts the ideal situation is you're still speaking at the two minutes and the examiner stops you which means you could actually speak for more than two minutes in that case um, and well, in terms of preparation make sure you look through all the topics and in, in terms of preparing the, the, the level of priority num number one your number one priority should be that you know who or what you're going to talk about for the topic in part two and then uh, maybe some ideas of what you're going to say about this topic I, I like to plan four main ideas because then you can expand those and you should be able to reach the minute and a half two minutes without problems um, part three four to five minutes long designed to be about six questions so about six sentences from you would be about right that's double part one part one's about three sentences on average and part three is about six sentences on average so you could still give a one two sentence answer and then later have a longer one right so so I say on average because sometimes people do themselves a disservice they purposely try to answer a question at length but actually the, the questions challenging for them um, and it might not be to do with English it might be part three and you get a question and you just can't think what your response is even in your own language uh, so if if the topic is about um, people we like to work with in part two part three could be a question like is it more important for children to learn how to cooperate or how to compete and that could be problematic you might just not know uh, what how, how to answer that question um, and you could just give a short answer like oh you know I'm not really sure but uh, offhand it's probably more important that they learn how to cooperate and then the examiner might follow up on this and say well why do you think that and then you could but by now you've had a bit more time to think and you might be able to uh, expand your answer a bit more um, all right so that's about all I want to say about that uh, I'll go through these grading levels just while I'm looking at that I, I want to look at the stream and yes it's streaming now that's good T trying to ask me some questions so I'm, I'm really trying to encourage questions from people because uh, that, that's the real reason why I want to be live I want people to ask me questions you can ask me any questions about speaking about the slides I'm showing you or or other things I don't mind I can an answer other things like if you want to ask me um, what's the best way to prepare if I only have one week or if my tests tomorrow what should I do the day before you can just type in questions like that I'll answer them and then I'll come back to my slides my slides are really just there as a backup so please try and ask me some questions um, oops so um, um, I'll, I'll just go through this really quickly and the the idea here is just to get some sort of idea of what do the IELTS scores mean this is from the perspective of the um, the receiver like the school that you might be applying to or the employer 
who's looking to hire someone overseas and they want to look at their IELTS score and have some sort of idea of what they could expect from this person's English right um, so number nine expert user near native it could even be a native right I mean native speakers normally get nine but not always there's some reasons why they don't sometimes if you want to know that then type it in as a question I could tell you why that is um, but yeah may, it, it doesn't it's not only native speakers though um, some non-native speakers could be a band nine it's like true level of excellence right if, if I'm speaking on the phone maybe I don't even know that this person is uh, not a native speaker um, and eight is a very high level speaker they've probably lived abroad for a number of years it, it's possible I've, I've had the odd student who's got band eight um, and never been abroad and wow I, I, I gotta say when I meet that kind of person I'm really impressed because it's hard to get to that level um, without living in the um, in an English speaking country and speaking every day it's, it's just difficult it's difficult to have the level of fluency um, it's difficult to have the level of um, uh, idiomatic language like naturally naturally because when you learn from textbooks that's not always the way people speak right so to, to be natural enough is very difficult um, so eight yeah uh, someone who's lived abroad maybe for may, maybe they've studied abroad and maybe they're now working abroad a, a seven often studied overseas maybe like done a bachelor degree maybe four years abroad gets them up to a band seven um, band sevens can be a little bit common with people that have never been abroad it is possible to get to that level if you've really put a lot of effort into your studies it's, it's not easy though um, for, for me band seven and above ha have some sort of talent with the language it's not just someone who oh they don't make many mistakes they've actually got to show some talent and I'm going to show you soon what I mean like what are some of the ways to show talent um, six competent user they're not doing too much wrong they can communicate fine yes there's errors but they're not normally interfering with understandability I can understand them well um, answers might not be so fluent you know it, it might take them a bit I, I might be kind of waiting on them a little bit have a sense of hurry up hurry up and tell me um, sometimes I'm an impatient person and um, you might just be waiting a little bit with a band six they might misuse some words but um, usually it's it's still understandable some of the um, less common topics could be a little bit of a struggle too um, a five okay for basic topics but once we get into sort of higher like basic topics I mean food weather once we get into higher level topics like maybe technologies influence on cooperation in the workforce workplace once we start getting into something a bit more uh, specific like that a band um, five and even six starts to struggle with that right um, I'm not going to go any lower uh, let's move on now so you, you probably know there's four grading criteria and you can see them on your screen now fluency and coherence vocabulary they call it lexical resource I think it's easy to just say vocabulary there is a subtle difference and if you're a band eight or nine then you probably know it um, don't think it matters it's really just vocabulary uh, grammar and pronunciation let's look at those in a bit more uh, detail I'll just check if there's any questions so far um, yeah there's a couple of questions great um, can the answer take one minute at part three um, so it's designed to be four to five minutes uh, a one minute answer is quite long um, it could the, the examiner might stop you though so they might after you've spoken for say about 40 seconds 30 40 seconds they might just stop you and go on with another question right uh, so from, from that perspective it, it depends a little bit right um, but but also like if, if you've given a couple of short answers 
and now you give a one minute answer if, if I'm the examiner I'll probably let that go because uh, I, w I want to hear you I want to see uh, all of your answer um, so I don't know I'm sort of saying it, it could happen it's, it's possible it would happen or it's also possible the examiner is going to jump in and cut you off and go on to the next question okay next question from Selen my level is 6.5 and I need a band 7.5 yeah, keep, keep studying and practicing um, I, I, I think sometimes it, it can be a mistake to focus too hard on what score you need like especially when you're going into the test room so if you're going into the test room and you're saying to yourself oh I need 7.5 oh last time I only got 6.5 oh don't think I can do it it's a kind of negative thinking I, I, I always encourage people to forget about well, like when, when you go into the test room right when you go into the test room forget about the grade you need focus on doing your best right so whatever the question is do your best it's a horrible question and you hate it do your best you make a mistake try and recover do your best for the rest of the test don't, don't be too tied up in the score when you're in the test room focus on doing your best if it doesn't get the score you need so be it now but before the test what could you do um, I'd have a really good look at the grading criteria uh, I'll put a link to that in the description there's like publicly available grading criteria you, you might like to have a good look at that and truly understand what it is that you need to be doing to get it to, to get to band 7.5 and and you should be looking at band 8 right because you need two eights one won't be enough um, let's let's dig into the grading a bit more because I think this will help you um, to know what you should be doing right uh, more so so um, let's uh, let's move on to the next slide so no half marks so I was just saying you're going to need two eights so you can't for, there's four grading criteria right but you can't get half marks for these so you can't get say 7.5 for fluency, fluency and coherence is going to be a whole number like a 6, a 7, an 8 or a 9 there's no 7.5 so that's why I'm saying you're going to need at least two eights one won't be enough because if you end up with 7.75 Oh, that would be enough. Um, let, let, let's say um, let's say you needed seven, and you've got three sevens and a six. Six point seven five gets rounded down and not up, so that can be challenging. So for for a seven point five, you need two eights. One's not enough. If you've got one eight and three sevens, it's not enough. Unless of course you've got a nine. Uh, nines are kind of rare. You don't want to be needing a nine, right? Um, so yeah so that's what I'm saying here about the tie breakers they get rounded down and not up 6.75 becomes 6.5 and and the other thing that people wonder sometimes is well do I get a score for each part no is a kind of holistic approach the examiner is listening to you and as you're speaking they are adjusting your score up and down they hear a mistake maybe they're pulling it down they hear an idiomatic expression they like now it's going up so they're just constantly assessing you uh, for me by the end of the part two I've normally kind of decided what grade I'm thinking I'm going to give the candidate and then I use part three to test so if for instance um, I feel the grammar might be a bit weak then I might ask questions that uh, I might play around with different tenses or something and try and test out the grammar a little bit uh, and, and, and then usually by the time the candidate walks out the door I've decided the score already and, and, and then what's the purpose of the recording that's if you request a remark and another examiner will listen to the recording give you a score the, the um, your examiner in the interview is allowed to listen to the recording and sometimes will just to check something but um, remember they've got people coming in you know you've seen the test room you go out pretty soon somebody else comes in there isn't really time to listen to the recording there's not a, not a lot of time um, okay 
then let's um, let's get some ideas so impact of errors so so the, the examiner is thinking of two things right they're thinking about the mistakes you're making but they're also thinking about any talent that you're showing like wow that was a great word or ooh, excellent idiomatic expression so they're thinking about talent but they're also thinking about mistakes and then sometimes people ask me well how many mistakes can I make with grammar and still get eight or still get seven and I can't give them an answer like three. I, th there's no instruction to examine, and and actually it depends. There's sort of if you think maybe three dimensions to an error. So the three dimensions, what are they? The and you can look at this car. H how serious is the error, right? If you miss out an S, big deal. Like I like um, tree, tree. I like tree instead of I like trees. Small error. I'm not thinking, oh, band five. Um, n n not unless that's happening with every answer, right? Every, there's no control over S's at all. That that could be an issue, but on its own, that's a that that's not a serious error. Um, what's a serious error then? Uh, just like a faulty structure, like um, uh, we we only use conjunctions after finished ideas, uh, but sometimes candidates are using it after an unfinished idea so uh, let's take a conditional if I study harder we don't put a con conjunction because the um, it's not a complete sentence it's not a finished idea if I study harder you're thinking yes um, so we wouldn't put a so there if I study harder so I'll get a higher score we take out the so if I study harder I will get a higher score now these conditionals are, are tricky right if the candidate uses it correctly I'm thinking seven and up and if they're making mistakes with them I'm thinking they're not seven right so it's a more serious error especially for band seven and up right it, it, it doesn't mean though you made one mis you do this one time now you can't get seven it doesn't mean that at all um, I'm, I'm thinking about other things as well and if, if you only made that mistake one time that'd be okay if I hit it two or three times then it is starting to prevent the seven right um, then we've got to think about the impact of the mistake if you make a mistake like I just told you if I study harder so I'll get a higher score um, the impact is the person made a mistake but I can still understand them I, I know what they mean so communication is still maintained a a bigger impact would be like huh what are you saying like if you say um, uh, well th this is not that serious but if you say I'm boring then I'm confused do you mean you're a boring person or do you just mean I'm bored right what, what did you do last weekend oh I'm boring so are you telling me you're a boring person or do you mean last boring person would mean you're always boring um, or do you just mean you were bored last weekend you didn't have a lot to do so that could be um, it's a kind of bigger impact when I don't know what you mean communication has broken down and then the frequency is really important how often do you make these errors if it's only one time you could still get to band 8 perhaps um, if it's a couple of times maybe band 7 more then I'm starting to think about band 6 because you've got some sort of uh, error that you, you don't even know what's right or what's wrong so like that boring board there's a rule um, if you're talking about your own feeling then you use an ED ending on the adjective I feel bored I feel tired and then if you are talking about the thing that gives you the feeling the thing gets an ing so the more movie is uh, boring Mike's live stream is interesting right so interesting I'm, I'm over pronunciating those words um, so it's just to sort of make them a bit clearer right well I really should have got a glass of water uh, never mind I think I think I can go on without it uh, all right so let's keep going 
we lost quite quite a bit of time by me not pressing a button for the live stream. I was teaching a fantastic lesson to myself. Um, all right, well, let, let's still try and get through these gradings. So have a bit of read of that. I'll just see if there's any questions. Um, so there's no more questions. May, maybe they'll emerge now as I talk about um, these uh, the grading criteria more. So fluency, first of all, it, it's really fluency and coherence. It's not just fluency, right? So it's fluency and coherence. Fluency is about the sort of speed that you're speaking at and coherence is more about the um, understandability. Does it make sense? Because somebody's mouth could be moving at a good speed. They got long answers and they're speaking, but what are they actually saying? I, I often get this feeling in part three that somebody's just kind of rambling. Ra rambling means they're speaking a bit off topic, right? So if somebody is, a ra if somebody is rambling in part three or anywhere uh, that could be an indication they're not a band eight maybe not even a band seven uh, and if it's memorized then they could be much lower um, so the the key indicators for fluency um, especially at sort of band seven and below level the speaking speed normal speed um, like for a native speaker, a normal sort of speed would be good. Uh, if you're a bit lower, then you, you might be lower than a native speaker, and then you're not a band eight, say fluency. In, in that case, like a band eight, I, I think should be near native. Um, so yeah, if, if if you're speaking at a slow speed, that's one of the indicators. And uh, what else though? Um, the length of your answers, if you can't produce long answers, then that's going to limit your score. Um, you're not going to be able to get to seven unless you can show the examiner an ability to give extended answers. And the other one is hesitations, like he hesitations after the question, like when, when I ask the candidate the question, a little bit of hesitation to think of the idea, that's okay, but mid-sentence hesitations are very bad. That usually indicates the person is stopping to uh, think of a word or grammatical structure right to express the idea so hesitating to think of an idea not so bad um, hesitating to think of a word or phrase not so good right um, now coherence is about your ability to sort of make sense to the listener and it's your job to do that. It's not the examiner's job to understand you. It's your job to make sure the examiner can understand you. And there's ways we can increase coherence. One of the best ways is by um, using um, linking phrases. There's a few reasons why I like chocolate. The main one is the uh, sweet, fragrant smell of it. I just find it the aroma... Um, I know, delicious or something um, and an, another reason why I really like chocolate is the taste right so I'm making it easier for the listener to understand all right um, really important in part three part three is the area where coherence often gets exposed a bit I ask a question the person finishes and I think well, what was it all about I, I I didn't even know what they were saying um, it, it happens a lot. Um, so there's a few ideas of connectives on your screen. This this is to do with the coherence part, right? Um, for example, when you're going to introduce an example. So if you give an example and then you add at the end of the sentence, for example, that's not ideal. Put the for example first. Tell me you're going to give me an example, then give me an example. Don't give me an example and then indicate oh that was an example because I've been listening all that time um, order of sentences we want logical development of ideas paragraphs it's just like when you're writing in part three of the speaking you can give a very similar paragraph that you would write if the examiner says um, uh, what are the advantages of um, uh, being able to cooperate well with other people then 
Um, you want logical development of ideas, you might start with a topic sentence. Well, I think there are a couple of merits of being able to work well with others. The first benefit is that people will always want to work with you. So you're going to find no difficulty in forming teams with other people. Um, another positive aspect might be that you'll get promoted in your job and then develop that a bit. Right? Um, a, a, another interesting way to increase coherence that most people don't know about, even, even native speakers might not know this, um, is to use um, pauses, to, to basically use punctuation when speaking. So when we're writing we have uh, commas, full stops, paragraph. A comma means a short pause, usually not a breath. A full stop is usually a longer pause with a breath. And a paragraph is even is even just a little bit longer than that. You're reloading, you're getting, it, it helps you the speaker, you're reloading your next idea and it helps the listener because they know a new idea is coming. So let's have a look at a um, couple of examples of um, punctuation uh, or, or pauses. So, so this is actually written, This you, you've probably seen this right, I've seen this a number of times on Facebook. Um, so the, the first one is let's eat grandma and the second one is let's eat grandma so the first one no well there is punctuation there's an exclamation mark at the end it, it, it could be interpreted this way let's eat grandma I'm hungry let's let's eat grandma she won't care if we eat you have a leg I'll have an arm so we're going to eat our grandmother. It's kind of disgusting, right? So that's not the intended meaning. It's more like you're suggesting to your grandmother um, to start eating. So let's eat, grandma, and not let's eat grandma. She looks delicious. <laughs> so that, that, that's a sort of fun way to indicate why um, punctuation is important when writing, but also when speaking. Right, because you could have the same. Like obviously, no one's going to eat the grandmother, but imagine it's it could be something else, and that pause or comma could be really important. Um, here, here's a whole paragraph. Um, I don't know if that's big enough. I I hope that's big enough on your screen. Maybe I can enlarge it a bit. You just missed the question a bit. So it's what what is so the questions? What are some of the different kinds of places? To go shopping like in your country maybe and this this is what I was talking about before you could have a topic sentence you could introduce idea one you could develop it you could introduce idea two develop it and then let's look at how we speak this how do we speak the punctuation remember short pause breath so it's like well there are I have to start again well there are a wide range of places to go shopping one of the most popular types is department stores. I think this is because they stock high quality products and always offer a money back warranty if you are unsatisfied with your purchase. So I'm actually breathing in a couple of places there. I'm, I'm breathing where the commas are and also because it's a really long sentence um, I'm actually breathing where the clauses are and, and maybe that's a better way to put it it, it, you are breathing where there's a comma but that's because it's creating a separation between clauses and then um, with this one there's no commas in there but uh, probably I, I would pause uh, here and here right here's a there, there should actually be a comma there in any case so some of it's just I've been lazy with commas um, so that just give you a bit of an idea of how you might structure an answer in part three in terms of the structure and also the breathing. Now also what happens is sometimes people are nervous and they're speaking at an unnatural speed and um, and what uh, oh yeah, yeah. And, and, and they breathe in the wrong places. Now th these pauses and breaths send signals to the listener right so if I'm hearing breathing at the wrong time this is going to impact coherence right because I'll, I'll be thinking there's a pause so now we're on to a new clause 
but actually we're halfway through one so now it gets a little bit confusing huh like like you you'd, a native speaker would just think subliminally without realizing there's something's funny here they know something's funny but they wouldn't know quite what it is and I don't mean funny ha ha I mean funny strange so, something's a bit strange about about the way this person's talking so that can affect fluency all right um, then uh, let, let's go on to pronunciation and oh just ha have a read of that and let me just check if there's any questions no there's no more questions questions would be good if I have questions it would be great okay so um, pronunciation so I, I, I would suggest you get some sort of teacher or somebody to listen at least a native speaker to listen to you so one of the problems people have is they have trouble with certain sounds so like somebody sometimes somebody tells me well I'm I've been getting six or six point five I can never get to seven and I don't know why and then um, let's say it's a, I, I'm not picking on nationalities but let's say it's a Vietnamese person when they're giving me this information they tell me um, I need um, I need seven but I can only get six point five or six point five so I hear six point five so or, already I've heard a bunch of pronunciation errors right set should be six and five should be five right so sometimes people are, have got pronunciation problems and it holds them back now it depends what country um, Japanese uh, like I said, I'm not trying to I just want to generalize right Japanese normally L and R big problem I, I had a mock test today with a Japanese student and I complimented her I said that she didn't have any problems with the L's and R's and it had a positive impact positive overall impact because you can get some spillover not only was I impressed with her pronunciation but it just kind of gives me a positive view on her speaking uh, overall right so that was really good um, S and SH uh, a lot of countries have trouble with these you, you're gonna have pro if you don't have an S and SH sound in your language you're probably gonna struggle with these two so lots of people have this uh, Vietnamese have trouble with that again um, C and CH is a little bit less common B or oh, B and P uh, Arabic speakers um, subcontinent speakers uh, Pakistan Bangladesh India have trouble with the B and P uh, my, my understanding is in, in a lot of those languages uh, they have one of those sounds but not both so it makes it a bit tricky uh, so the B and P P we push out air and B we don't really um, another way for you to know what you might have trouble with too is if you've heard foreigners speaking your language what what problems do they have you probably have the reverse of those problems that's often the case um, next one not pronouncing syllables IELTS um, I can't remember that I, I, I think it that was really about the endings about I hear IELTS kind of like the phi and the sick sometimes I hear IELTS but not IELTS that tss is hard to say that that's hard for Arabic speakers as well the tss ending uh, chips chips uh, a, an Arabic speaker will normally say chip is uh, can't say chips I had a student and I spent about one hour <laughs> he he started to get it towards the end but it was well, it was humorous it wasn't really frustrating we were laughing about it but he just couldn't get the pss, chips it was hearing chips and uh, oh, I was crisps crispers I was hearing crispers and I said it's not Christmas it's crisps it took some effort finally get there that you, you you work on it you can get there so that so those are things that you need to pay attention to they're kind of mistakes but then um, seven and above we need some positive features right 
and uh, whoops not him he is a, if you've ever uh, that's, that's a long story um, so what are the features that you need but, but by the way it's got to like two o'clock my time and I, I normally stop now but I'll, I'll, I'll go on a bit longer because we got off to a, a late start so I'll probably go for about another 10 minutes and then stop so in order to get a high score for the um, pronunciation you need some features of native speakers intonation stress um, those pauses that I would tell what I was telling you about sort of natural chunking of the language that the pauses come in the right places like a pause normally for each clause and then end of the sentence we get a longer pause and a breath right so these are the features of native speakers intonation is the tone of your voice and sometimes people tell me oh Chinese Chinese has four tones or if it's Cantonese eight tones or if it's Thai I think Thai has four tones so there's a lot of tonal languages so sometimes I hear oh my language has tones English doesn't have any actually it has a lot of tones for in, but but not on so much on words it's more at the sentence level um, tone kind of can alter the meaning of the sentence I, I, I got a good way to illustrate this in a minute so I'll, I'll get on to that um, but uh, Oh, let, let's do that first. I'll, I'll show you it now. So, so here we have the same sentence, but I alter the meaning by changing the tone of a word. It doesn't change the meaning of the word so much. It changes the meaning at the sentence level. So the first one, I didn't say he stole the money. The emphasis is on I. It sort of means I didn't say it. Somebody else did. You're falsely accusing me. And then the next one, I didn't say he stole the money emphasis on the didn't I just didn't say that at all I don't know what you're talking about next one I didn't say he stole the money I didn't say it I was just suggesting it I think he did it but I didn't actually say it I didn't say he stole the money I didn't say Brian did it I said Tom stole the money Tom's the thief not Brian I didn't say he stole the money uh, next one I didn't say he stole the money emphasis on stole maybe he just borrowed it and was going to put it back later right that, that's enough I think you get a bit of an idea um, and then stress we use like in those sentences before it was about the tone but it's also about the stress right in English in every clause there'll be one word that's that's stressed and that's the most important word but then we also have word stress so we have a, a photograph emphasis on the foe um, but then we don't say a photographer we say a f f photographer so the first syllable becomes de-stressed schwa sound and the second syllable now becomes our bigger syllable fo Photo, oh sorry, photographer, so photographer, and then third one, photographic, photographic, right? So that's kind of important for band seven and up. If you only need a six, just don't make too many mistakes. Vocabulary, common errors, just small things with like the endings of words, like I was talking earlier about. Uh, I feel bored. Ed, the movie's boring. If I say I am boring, that means I am a boring person. You won't enjoy talking to me. Um, and, and then what do we do to impress the examiner to get to band seven and up? Well, we need to have some high level language, but it, it needs to be somewhat natural. So sometimes people get excited about ooh, idiomatic expressions and then they come into the test room and they tell me it was raining cats and dogs smile on their face they think I did a great job I just used an idiomatic idiomatic expression yeah but it's kind of stale and nobody really says that anymore stale I mean it's it's overused in the past and now people don't really say that um, all right and then collocation certain words go together we talk about tall people tall buildings but we don't talk about a tall salary it's a high salary so we use high with um, things that we can't see and touch and we use tall with 
physical things. We talk about tall trees and not high trees. Um, so that's collocation. Paraphrase is an indicator of band 7 and beyond. So the examiner says, what are the advantages of traveling overseas? And you say, I think there are a number of merits of going abroad. So you go from advantages to merits and going overseas to abroad. That's paraphrase. And, and then the last one, the colloquial idiomatic language. Um, so you need some of that and you should be preparing some for your test. Uh, use ones that you can use for a lot of things. There's a lot of questions about people. So you can have early bird, night owl. Those are good ones to use. Um, liking, disliking. Um, big fan of. Huge. I'm a huge fan of. Uh, or you don't like something. That's simply not my cup of tea. Alright, so we want to have some high level language to impress the examiner. Now, you, you need this for band 7. If you're like Selen and you're trying to get to band 8, you need lots of it. right? And then someone will say, well, how many? Um, I'd, I'd be preparing, I'd, like part 2 answer, 2 or 3, maybe even 4, at, at least 2 or 3 pieces of idiomatic language in there. Um, and like throughout the test I'd want to see like at least five or more and, and, and then I would quite like for band 8 to see some topic specific vocabulary as well um, and that's going to depend on your luck a bit with the topic right um, but where, yeah so it's just an example of here word endings I'm boring he, he really means uh, I'm bored um, I haven't seen that TV show for a while um, and you need to be natural with the language too. So we've got this great word plethora, which means more than enough. Um, but then people sort of misuse it a bit. They might say um, there's a plethora of reasons for something. And then there's only really a couple of reasons. That's not really a plethora. A plethora is like when you see, um, you know, you go to an intersection and there's a Starbucks on every intersection. You can say, wow, there's a plethora of Starbucks something like that. Um, what have we got for the example? The best way to solve obesity is to build a plethora of parks. Yeah, it just sounds a bit funny, I'd say, um, to build um, a park in every suburb or more parks would seem sort of natural. Um, why, why would you need more than enough as well, right? Plethora is more than what's needed, really. Um, I talked about this co-location paraphrase I mentioned. Oh, sometimes you might have to use paraphrase too. Like, imagine you're trying to talk about going to the hospital to get your blood pressure checked and you know there's this, let's say even you're a nurse, you know there's a specific term but you've forgotten what it is. Well, you just don't know. I mean, do you know what that is? I, I guess you could say like a blood pressure measure or something like that, but if, if I'm not wrong, the real name for this thing is uh, sphygmomometer. Sphygmomometer. So, I'm not even 100% sure that's right, but I think it's a sphygmomometer. And so you don't know that, right? So you could just say, well, a sort of band that a doctor puts around your arm to test your blood pressure. And that's fine. That's okay that you don't know this very specialized word, right? It, it's not really counting as a negative. In, in a way, it's a positive because you're showing that you have an ability in English that if you don't know a word, you can paraphrase. You can still keep effective communication by talking around this topic. So that's a good thing. Uh, there's some colloquial language. Grammar. It's a bit like the vocabulary. I'll just have a, well, I'll have a quick look if there's any questions. Um, yeah, the P and B, that's right, is, is trouble for some speakers. Um, practice it daily. Um, and you're preparing. Yeah, that's good. The, so the key point is to keep preparing and keep focusing on doing your best. And the reverse of that is to get negative about things. And Oh, gosh, I, I've taken lots of tests and I still can't get the score I need. Oh, I, I just want to give up. And, and I've had people that give up. And my advice would be don't give up. Every person who sticks with it passes in the end, I, I, I guess. You know, 7.5 is not easy. Um, 
So uh, Nguyen is saying, I took the test last month. The examiner kept stopping me in part one. Um, it's because they're trying to get through about 11 questions and your answers are probably, um, I'm not going to say too long, well, too, too long for the examiner to ask all his questions. So what they're doing is they're stopping you to get on to the next question. It's not a negative. It doesn't mean you made a mistake. It doesn't mean you're off topic. Off topic, they'll let you keep going, but it, what it means is the answers are, are getting to be um, to the length where they want to stop you and move on. Okay, back to the grammar. Um, grammar. So, um, just want to move me so I'm not on the slide. Just make that slide a bit smaller. Okay, um, put it over here, even better. Uh, so don't make mistakes, um, but that's not really enough to get seven and beyond, right? So the, the examiner is going to be thinking about mistakes that you make. They could be with tenses, they could be with word order, um, they could be those conditionals, there's no if so. Um, but for band seven and above, you need to show talent. They're going to be looking for a variety of sentence types. So we've got simple sentences, just one clause. We've got compound sentences where there's two, two clauses separated by conjunction. That's a compound sentence. And then complex sentence, no conjunction. We have a dependent clause, then an independent clause, or the other way around. A dependent clause means that it depends on another clause. It, the idea is unfinished. These are the ones the examiners are looking for the most. Why? Because they're challenging. People make a lot of mistakes on them. If you can get them right, it indicates you're band 7 and above. If you're consistently getting them wrong, not a band 7. Right? So th this is where you should be putting your energy. Don't If you're testing a month, don't be buying grammar books and just reading from start to finish. That's not going to have an impact unless you've got a year, and then it might help. Um, I, I, I mean, you could get that same book, but then target specific things in there. Target a couple of conditionals. Target some relative clauses. Um, we probably look at some of those. So let's let's have a look at a couple of types of complex sentences. So it, it, there's more than one clause in there, right? A dependent clause and an independent. At, at least one dependent clause. There's one unfinished ideas in, uh, idea in the sentence. And, and note that we want complex sentences, but not complicated ones. Don't have big, long, you know, sentences with five clauses in them. That, that's too long. That's too difficult for the listener to understand. The coherence is starting to come down. And if you make a mistake, the impact of it will, could be quite serious. It could mean that the examiner can't understand you. Down comes your score, right? Um, oh, I, I, I really wanted to give you some samples of speakers, but we're kind of out of time. So I th I'm thinking I'm going to stop there for today. Uh, type in your questions, though, because I'll, I'll cover any questions. And if you're not live, if you're listening to this after the lesson, put your uh, questions in the comment section below and I, and I will answer them. Um, and and then I just wanted to tell you also that I'm thinking next week, uh, I, I kind of said all, most of what I wanted to say about speaking for now, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go on to writing and what I want to do is um, talk about the grading a bit like today. Like, like I'll do a series of them. So do it for a few weeks writing, um, not just the grading criteria, really about um, how to prepare for writing and in particular what are the different types of essay questions that we get in the test and how do we respond to them. I've got I've got six kinds and um, it's going to be a bit tricky with academic in general because uh, I, I, I will cover those as well, I think. Pro probably I'll start with the essay writing. But with the the task one academic, I want people to understand that there's four types of tasks that they need to prepare for. And then for the general test takers, what are the different types of um, letters that you need to write, formal, semi-formal, 
and what are some of the common uh, task instructions that you have to be able to respond to like invitations and thanking people for things and apologizing for things uh, so that's what I'm thinking to sort of go on to maybe might just take a break from the speaking for a bit um, so make sure that if, if you're listening to this and you want to follow this every week uh, you you should be able to select so like, de definitely subscribe to me if you subscribe then as soon as I go live you get a message and if you're online um, but you'll also see it in the Facebook upcoming um, and yeah it'll be every Saturday at the same time as, as today which should be uh, one o'clock Indo China time and GMT it's um, never great with time zones it's uh, so it starts at one o'clock my time so minus seven from that so what's that um, uh, six six a.m. is that right should be six a.m. GMT I, I, I always put it in the description of the video anyway you can have a look at that so let me go and just check if there's any final questions and if not I'm going to stop okay so alright there aren't any other questions you can um, uh, watch this after the live stream and, and I've also got other live streams for the speaking test and then for other things like if you want to see the current questions that are in the test just have a look on my YouTube channel and, and, and if you are interested in the writing I've just started releasing videos explaining the different types of essays and how to respond to them all right have a have a great weekend uh, hope that you uh, learned something from today's lesson and now I'm going to stop the stream all right so best of luck everyone uh, look in the 